Jennifer, we actually did this story back on December 23rd. Yeah. <laughs> on the website. Um, it's a little nervous laughter because this is a really awful topic. But we did this story back on December 23rd uh, on the website, and then the news cycle went absolutely insane. And um, we even reached a point where I was stopped saying, like, it's coming. It was just like, but we're finally here. The story on abusive head trauma is uh, here. So one of the mods and admins, if you could go on to malcontentnews.com, find the, the story. It's December 23rd. Uh, and put a link in the uh, comments, uh, then our audience can go to that story that we're talking about. Uh, abusive head trauma is more known, probably more known by a lot of people, as shaken baby syndrome. And shaken baby syndrome uh, was coined about 45 years ago. Um, and there were several doctors who came up with what they felt was this, this triad of symptoms. And the triad of symptoms, put in layman's terms, is bleeding around the brain, retinal bleeding, and brain damage. And what they concluded was, if, you, if, a, if an infant or a toddler appears with these three symptoms, the only possible way that this could happen is if the baby was violently shaken. And that science has started to be called into question, and it's been called into question for a decade, in part because medical science has gotten better. Um, our ability to diagnose and test, especially with imaging for brain injuries, has gotten much better. Um, mm -hmm. But what happened, Jennifer, is in the 90s, several hospitals around the country started almost becoming specialist centers for mm -hmm. shaken baby syndrome, a term, by the way, that isn't really used anymore in medical circles. It is considered archaic and inaccurate. We're going to go ahead and roll a clip to give some background and history on that. Caveat, um, these clips talk about child abuse. They uh, have parents who are guilty of child abuse. They have parents who were accused of child abuse and then found not to have committed abuse. This is a very sensitive and difficult topic. So again, uh, not your thing. Go find something to do for about three minutes and come back. Baby Colt's former babysitter refused to look at the pictures of the little boy she was supposed to take care of. You'd see him and he would smile just ear to ear. His future could have been anything he dreamed of. Instead, she looked down and away, wiping tears from her eyes, getting ready to receive her prison sentence. That was my first grandson, and he got taken away from me. Kelsey Brisano shook the 12-month-old so hard he almost died, but for months he lived with what was left of his brain swollen outside his skull. Good evening, everyone. A raging debate in child abuse cases is getting louder. It has to do with shaken baby syndrome, the traumatic brain injury it can cause, and a few now say it doesn't exist at all. But across the country, cases are being dismissed or overturned on appeal. Critics say shaken baby syndrome is being misdiagnosed based on a narrow set of criteria, convictions based on science that's now being questioned. Shaken baby syndrome was first developed as a theory 40 years ago that infants with three specific signs or symptoms had injuries that were caused by violent shaking and that nothing else could cause them. All three experts say there's a variety of causes for those same three symptoms, even a premature birth or vitamin D deficiency, which DeClara believes is the case with her son. But in her case, the doctor told the judge that theory is not commonly accepted in the medical community. A lot of kids can get subdural hematomas from trauma and from other reasons. Biomechanics is adding to the skepticism. The Washington Post conducting an experiment with baby dummies and found a grown man shaking a 22 pound baby generated only six G's of force, while a short fall can generate more than 10 times the force of shaking alone. In your medical opinion, have you ever seen a case where just shaking the child <coughs> caused the fatal injury? No. Uh, you know, it's 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 a tough story and it's a tough topic. So why are we covering this? Um, the reason we're covering this is in the research around this, uh, about 1,300 people a year or 1,300 children are identified 
of suffering from abusive head trauma. Mm -hmm. The challenges that you have is that when, when a child arrives in the emergency department and presenting with abusive head trauma, um, they are typically nonverbal. They're going to be either nonverbal because of their injuries or they're nonverbal because of their age. So they are incapable of advocating for themselves, both good and bad. Um, yeah. And what I alluded to is that some hospitals, Jennifer, had started creating these departments that specialize in the investigation of abusive head trauma. But what was yeah. going on at these facilities is that the social workers and the doctors that were involved were kind of basing this all on this questionable science. And surprise, mm -hmm. surprise, at the hospitals where they set up these centers of, you know, centers of excellence or centers of research, the number of people that were getting labeled child abusers arriving in the emergency departments exploded. At one hospital mm -hmm. in Nebraska, it almost went up exponentially. Um, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, child abuse numbers were not going up at overall numbers and the statistics were not going up at the same time on the curve. And guess who was getting caught up in the most child abuse allegations? Uh, people of color. BIPOC. Exactly. BIPOC. And here's the interesting thing. If you went through the hierarchy, if you were white, straight couple, married and wealthy, mm -hmm. you were the least likely to be accused. And as you kind of went down the ladder, if you were BIPOC and poor and say English was a second language for you, you were the most likely to be accused. So much so that it goes out of the statistical capabilities. And when um, data scientists looked at all of the available data and tried to account for every possible factor that they could imagine. The outliers didn't fit. The other thing that they discovered is that if a white wealthy parent show up in the emergency room and they're like, Bobby fell down the stairs and Bobby's mm -hmm. actually getting abused, uh, they're more likely to believe Bobby fell down the stairs versus if a BIPOC parent shows up and says Bobby fell down the stairs they're treated more like a suspect. Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, sadly, that does not surprise me at all. Um, I mean, if you look at the rates um, in which children are removed from um, BIPOC homes, um, and this has been a really big thing uh, within Indigenous communities. Of course, there was a big big case uh, last year about, um, I can't, the name is escaping me, but there's an, actually an act in place that uh, now helps to protect uh, Native kids being taken out of and placed in non-Native homes and, and allow them to um, go to live with family members. Um, but yeah, so this, this isn't surprising to me at all. It's gross, um, but I think if this is just a really another strong, strong example of the systemic, systemic racism um, at work within our society. Um, and in the medical community, which is also well documented. The, the one thing I wanted to say, we, I, I am not up here saying that sh uh, abusive head trauma in children does not exist. Children yeah. are shaken. It is a legitimate, it is a legitimate, it's a crime and it should, you know, it should be taken away. And there are other signs that they are learning beyond these three symptoms, because originally the thought was the only way you could get these three symptoms was by shaking a child. But what they have learned is, as some of the things that were brought up, premature, uh, preemies can display these three symptoms as they're continuing to grow and develop. Uh, another thing uh, that can happen here is that children that are born with a seizure disorder, um, mm -hmm. if they are having repeated seizures, they could start displaying all of these symptoms. And the challenge is um, blood around the brain and brain damage can be yep. signs of untreated, severe um, mm -hmm. seizures that are going on. And there are, and what parents have reported is that if the social workers or a medical person has concluded it was child abuse, they are completely cut out. So yep. parents, yep. parents that have been falsely accused have gone, well, wait a minute, we want an MRI or we want to get yep. this done. And the state just comes in and says, we're not doing any of that, you're an abuser, done. And there's been some cases, Jennifer, where they've actually blocked tests that not only would help exonerate the parents, but would possibly help treat the child. Yeah. So, I mean, think how many how many children were potentially placed in the system and taken away from their parents um, because of this? 
Uh, well, what's happening in is what's happened over, say, about the last 10 years is literally hundreds of cases have been revisited yeah. and reversed. Um, and parents have gone to prison over this. Um, yeah. And as more evidence has emerged, um, parents are going back. But to be falsely accused of child abuse yeah. is in itself a traumatic experience because part of the other research that we discovered was People who are falsely accused of child abuse develop a deep mistrust of the system, of the medical yep. community, and of the government. What a shock. Yep. No, absolutely. And I just wanted to point out when I was talking about um, this being an issue with Native people in particular, um, the 1978 Indian Child Welfare Act. That's why I, the name I forgot. Um, so I wanted to, to get that out there. Yeah, no, I... I agree. And I think there are so many. Uh, so when my son was actually two, I used to work in horse racing. And so he was in the barn with me one day and he was standing on a bale of hay and he'd fallen off. And so when he fall off, he kind of knocked himself out and he had blood coming out of his ear. So I called an ambulance. Um, I went through because, of course, you know, I'm working in horse racing. I'm a single parent. I was like filthy, dirty when they came and I go to take him to the emergency room or in Portland. I got grilled like people in there, you know, Luckily, I had a witness that was there and saw it, but it was kind of leaning leaning towards this, you know, did something more erroneous kind of happen thing. Um, so I can't even imagine what it must be like uh, to be, you know, accused of this and have it go to court and, you know, have this be something that's on your your permanent record, but also, you know, potentially lose access to your child because of it. Yes, and it's traumatic for the child. Um, it's even more traumatic for the child if, if the parent has been loving and kind and did nothing wrong. Um, it's very traumatic for the child and uh, to be torn away from their parent like that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the critical things, not a lawyer, but the critical things are, one, if your child, if you suspect at all that there is a closed head injury, I mean, if there's an open head injury, you should be going to the doctor or doc in the box or an ER, period. If you even remotely expect there is a closed head injury, you should get your child checked out. That's number one. Because one of the red flags is, and it is more of a marker of potential abuse, um, people that, uh, abusers, when they're like, oh God, I... I almost killed my kid, are very reluctant to take them to the ER. Yeah. You hear these stories of they waited two days, they waited four days, and, and the child has deteriorated to a point. Yeah. So that's point number one. You know, point number two is remember, Child Protective Services has almost extra judi judicial power um, mm -hmm. that, that goes beyond the Constitution. And my counsel to you, lawyer up or get a yeah. social worker and don't talk to them. Um, and that's my counsel. That would be my counsel to you if you're looking at an accusation. Um, and the other thing is that I will close this with, if you're a parent and if you're frustrated, and I, <laughs> I've, certainly I've read nobody that says I'm ready to beat my kid and I think that I mean it, but you know, with COVID and you're locked in and you're stuffed here, get help, right? Get, call a friend, you know, the other thing is, I, look, there's a couple of times my kids screaming their heads off, yada, 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 meaning, you know, be, if they're in the crib, they're not going anywhere. You just go yeah. outside, take a quick walk around the block or even just up and down the driveway or something for a few minutes. You just kind of clear your head. Yeah. And, or if you're in an apartment, walk in the hallway for a couple of minutes right outside the door. That's not child abuse. You're keeping your, you're keeping close enough to the kid. Just get your breath. If, if you reach that point where you're, then walk away. Walk yeah. away. Yeah. I agree anyway. with that. Jennifer, thank you for the conversation. We're